Okay, uh, so what I was saying before, um, before technical issues briefly got in the way, is that we'll start by briefly reminding ourselves what radians are. And a radian is an alternative way of measuring an angle. It's an alternative to a degree. And there are two pi radians in a circle. And that's, you know, versus 360 degrees. Um, one way you could formally define radians is using the unit circle, um, which if you may or may not remember is also how we define the sine and the cosine. If you have a unit circle, so that is to say a circle with a, with a radius of one centered at the origin, then you can define radians in terms of distance. If you start here on the unit circle, and travel some distance d counterclockwise, then that angle you form is d radian. So that's how radians are Normally defined um, in practice, I think we normally just remember a few angles. A 90 degree angle is pi over two radians. A 100 degree, 180 degree angle is pi radians. A, can't even think, 270 degrees, I want to say, is three pi over two radians. And then a full rotation is two pi radians. And when we do out to this, we need to be measuring angles in radians. And that's actually kind of surprising because I mean, radians and degrees just measure the same thing, right? They just measure angles. I mean, if you're doing a geometry, it doesn't matter what your unit is. The area of a circle is two pi the radius squared, and it doesn't matter whether the radius is in inches or miles or kilometers. But in calculus, our formulas assume that we are um, using radians and they break if we're not. So the first thing we're going to do is make sure that our calculators are in radian mode, and then we'll leave them there for the entire semester. 
So they're in radian mode by default. So if you've never changed anything, then they're already the way they need to be. But it's this mode button up here next to the blue setting button. If you click it, So I, I don't know what, they changed the emulation software and now there's like a second long input lag. But anyway, um, you see Radian is highlighted here. Again, if you never changed it, it will be highlighted on your calculator too. But if at some point you did change it, so you'll see this, you'll see degree highlighted, and you'll just go down there. I was wrong, a four second lag, that's extreme. But you'll go down here and you'll press the enter button and radians will then be highlighted. So if we now go back, um, it's it's sort of hard to say why. Um, well, it's hard to say in a way that's going to mean much to anyone why we need our angles to be measured in radians instead of degrees, but it does kind of justify the time that we spend on that material. Like you learn about radians in pre-calculus or trigonometry, and then you spend the rest of the semester being very unclear why you would want to use these instead of degrees. Well, you need to use them instead of degrees when you're doing calculus. And now we'll remind ourselves of the sine and the cosine, and then four other trigonometric functions. We'll start by using the unit circle, then we'll very briefly review right triangle trigonometry. And, you know, speaking of learning things and then it being kind of unclear what the big deal is, when you see the sine and the cosine defined, it is not a natural definition, or at least certainly I never thought it was a natural definition. Um, it's, it's surprising that this definition gives rise to such an important uh, branch of mathematics, but to define the sine of the cosine and the cosine, we uh, plunk down a Cartesian plane, And then we draw, as best as we are able, a unit circle. Again, unit means one. So when I'm talking about unit circles, I'm talking about a circle with a radius of one. Doom is not playing nice today. I'm talking about a circle with a radius of one that's, you know, what am I doing? That's trapped between 
negative one and positive one as you see. And we have some number and you no, know, let, let's say theta. And you want to talk about the cosine of theta and the sine of theta, which are abbreviated as you remember, or if you don't, I shouldn't tell you what you remember, you know if you remember it or not. As you've seen before, um, cosine and sine are abbreviated cos and sin. I, well, um, and you can think of taking of the cosine and the sine of angles. In fact, the way they're defined using the unit circle, it sort of makes the most sense if that you think of theta as an angle, but theta doesn't have to be. Theta can be time of day, for example. It could be anything. But whatever theta is, whether it was originally an angle or not, you use it to create an angle on the unit circle. And you see that this ray hits the unit circle there. And that point has an X coordinate and a Y coordinate. And the X coordinate is what we call the cosine. And the Y coordinate is what we call the sine. Another way of presenting this same information would be that if we created a right triangle by that, the cosine and the sine are the legs of the right triangle. So, there are the sine and the cosine, and you know, perhaps, that there are six trigonometric functions. But in general, we use the unit circle to define the sine and the cosine alone. It's actually possible to use the unit circle to define all six trig functions. So, like, if you, if you draw a tangent line down there, the length of this segment of the tangent line is the tangent, hence why it's called the tangent, if you've ever wondered about that. But... But that's not stuff we're going to need in this course. We'll follow the, um, the standard sort of process of defining the sine, defining the cosine, and then defining the other six trig functions in terms of the cosine and the sine. And they are... Tangent. Again, I apologize for the, the 
quality of the handwriting. Usually Zoom has uh, whiteboards has settled down by now. I'm still getting these kind of awkward input delays. I don't know how to fix that. Anyway, the tangent is the sine divided by the cosine. And the way in trigonometry is taught, um, you probably learned that there are there's the sine, there's the cosine, there's the tangent, and then there are three other trig functions. It's like certainly in high school geometry as, as I learned it in Pennsylvania. That was sort of how things worked out. We uh, learned about all six trig functions, but it seemed strongly implied that only three of them actually matter. Um, Calculus. is sort of surprising in what trig functions we care about and what trig functions we don't. I mean, we'll learn facts about all of the trig functions, but when we start really using this, which won't be until calculus two, I'll say, the trig functions we'll really care about will be the sine, the tangent, and the secant. The cosine will be less important than we'd probably expect. So, and the secant will be more important than we'd probably expect. So let's remind ourselves what the secant is. It's one divided by the cosine. And then, let me separate them. We'll learn a few facts about the cosecant and the cotangent. They show up a lot less often than the sine, tangent, and secant, but You should, you should know what they are. Cosecant is abbreviated CSC. And, uh, is the only trig function that isn't just the first three letters because we've already used cos. I was starting to write an error. The cosecant is one divided by the sine. And then the cotangent has two equivalent definitions. You can say that the cotangent is one divided by the tangent. You can also say that the cotangent is the cosine divided by the sine. And these naming conventions are a little cryptic, or, or at least I've always thought they were a little cryptic. I mean, if the cotangent is one divided by the tangent, one would like for the cosine to be one divided by the sine, but that is not true. The cotangent is the only cofunction that's the reciprocal of the non 
whole function. Um, likewise, when you look at the secant and the cosecant, the co's don't match. The secant is one divided by a co-function, whereas the cosecant is one divided by a non-co-function. So it's kind of awkward committing these to memory, but you know, if if you have forgotten this since trigonometry. I mean, at the very least, the secant and the tangent, you absolutely will need to know. And it would certainly be good to know the other two. Um, so we've defined these trig functions. We define two of them in kind of a special way using the unit circle. And then we, um, how to say, then we use those two special definitions to define the other four. Again, when you see these definitions, it makes this whole thing seem kind of cryptic, like, you can define the sign the way you define the sign, but it's hard to see why you'd ever want to use it. Um, the utility of the sign and the cosine becomes clear when you look at their graphs. So let's remind ourselves what the graphs of the sine and the cosine look like. Do I have Desmos up? I do, so I just need to share it. And I fail, I shared the calculator. Let's try this a second time. It is my day to be confounded by technology. Yes, folks, here we are. You're screen sharing allegedly, but I don't see Desmos. Come on, Firefox, work with me. Um, okay, okay, whatever. Some, sometimes get frazzled by things that don't actually matter. It's the easiest thing in the world to pull up a new Firefox window and then do this again and then be where we are. Um, if, if you're wondering, it's because I'm recording these and Desmos won't show up in the recording if I'm not properly sharing it, that I'm fighting this fight. So the sine and the cosine look like waves. And once we've seen that, it suddenly becomes very clear why we want functions like this. Because, you know, there are hundreds, thousands of real world things that we want to model that are shaped like waves. I mean, the obvious example was being waves, radio waves, sound waves. If we want to do uh, light in quantum mechanics, if we want to do any math with those, we need the sine and the cosine. So they don't have the nicest or most natural definition but they're really important for a lot of modeling. Um, the other six trig functions 
I mean, I can put them on the board there. You look at like the graph of the tangent, it's a lot, uh, a lot less obvious where a graph like this would show up. Um, having said that, I can give an example where this graph would show up. Um, let me get back to the whiteboard and let me... There's the sign. There's the cosine, um, much less artistically than we got from Desmos. And as for the tangent, let me think. I remember, I'm trying to remember where these lines are oriented. What's the tangent of zero? It's the sine of zero over the cosine of zero, which is zero. So, right. So the tangent looks like this, more or less. Um, what you've seen with the sine, the cosine, and the tangent are that their graphs are the same pattern repeated over and over again. Um, the tangent is a lot less sort of natural looking than the sine and the cosine, but for example, say we have a wall and say we have a police car, and this police car has its light on, so the light is rotating, so it's casting a shadow on the wall. And as the light rotates, the shadow moves. So we've got a directional light source, which is rotating. And let me see if I remember this. If we want to look at the um where the light is, that's going to be determined by a trig function, by the tangent more specifically. Um, I feel like I might not have this picture exactly correct, but that's okay. I just wanted to sort of get at the idea that we there are real world situations where this seemingly not very natural looking graph show up. Um, for the other four, I cannot help you the the other um the other three i guess they look pretty pretty unnatural and maybe they are because i don't know any real world situation that we would model using the secant and the cosecant i mean i guess I say the other four, the cotangent isn't so bad. The, the cotangent just looks like the tangent flipped around. But the secant, even though I said that this is an important function that shows up in calculus, once we get to calculus two, it has a graph that's kind of, well, again, it's hard to imagine the, the real world situation that would produce this graph. 
the graph might look less unnatural if we look at the secant and the cosine at the same time. The secant is one divided by the cosine. So when the cosine is getting close to zero, the secant is shooting up to infinity. And then, <clears throat> You. The cosecant looks basically the same, except instead of the cosine, the cosecant is defined in terms of the sine. So when the sine gets close to zero, this shoots to infinity. Yeah. Any... I mean, I've, this is the screen. That is not what I wanted. I wanted the whiteboard. Does anybody have any questions? I mean, as I say, what we mostly want for calculus is to have a general idea, you know, we should know uh, the unit circle definition. So, I mean, and we, of course, we should know what, what the tangent is, what the secant is. We should know those definitions. We should have a basic idea of what at least the sine and the cosine look like. The other graphs are probably less important. We should maybe know a little right triangle trigonometry. Honestly, I'm ambivalent about that because that won't, won't really be used until calculus two. And I'm not sure if there's a lot of utility in, uh, in doing review right now, if it's then going to be months and months and months before we use it. Um, I guess if I was going to do it anyway, I shouldn't have told you. I wasn't sure of the utility. That's probably not great pedagogy. But um, the sine and the cosine, the way you see them defined in like a high school geometry class is probably using unit circles. Nope. Is probably using right triangles is what I meant to say there. You've got an opposite side, the side opposite the angle, the side adjacent to the angle, as we call it, and the hypotenuse. Um, opposite is, you know, pretty clear if we think of the angle as a person, the, this is the wall that's opposite to him. Adjacent is a little weirder because, I mean, you can say that this is adjacent to the angle, but the hypotenuse is also adjacent to it in exactly the same way. Still, that's the terminology we've settled on. And the ratios of these um, sides give trig functions, not the bite. Let's try that letter again. The sine of an angle is the opposite over the hypotenuse. And um, when, when we learn this in geometry, um, it's sort of how we define the sign. Um, but notice that this isn't a great definition because it only works if 
theta is positive, and if theta is between zero and 180 degrees. That is to say, between zero and pi over two radians. And that's just because of the geometry of a triangle. So we have this sort of definition, and then we give the unit circle definition. That that's theta be negative, or that's theta be big. The cosine is the adjacent over the hypotenuse. The tangent is the opposite over the adjacent. And the other three trig functions are not traditionally defined in terms of the right triangle. And the way students traditionally memorize this is using the nonsense word Sokotoa, um, sine opposite hypotenuse, cosine adjacent hypotenuse, tangent opposite adjacent. The way I learned this, this is the memory aid our textbooks gave. Some old horse, catch another horse, zoom, catch another horse, take, oh, away. Remember it however you want, but at some point you will need this. And I mean, I, I said, oh, maybe we shouldn't review this now. It's, but I mean, basically anyone who's in a calculus course needs to know this. I mean, if you're in math education, you're presumably grade six through nine, you might be teaching this. If you're in science, you need this. If you're a pure math student, you certainly need this. So maybe thinking of it in terms of when we use it in calculus is misguided. It's stuff you need to know, and we review. There's only one other thing in this section that I want to cover. The textbook um, is kind of scattershot and goes through some material that I don't think we should review right now. Like I think some of the more complicated trig identities are in there. This isn't a good time to, to memorize those. Um, there is one trig function that we probably should commit to memory, and that's the Pythagorean identity. And I think it's fair to say that if you went to a math conference uh, full of 
math PhDs and started asking people to recite, you know, the sum and difference identities. Most of us would not be able to do that, but most of us would be able to recite the Pythagorean identity. It's just more important than the others. And the Pythagorean identity says that the sine squared, um, as a quick review, when we square the sine or the cosine or the other trig functions, we put this two between the name of the trig function and the argument. That's because if we put the two there, it's not clear. Are we squaring the sine or are we squaring the theta? So in order to avoid that ambiguity, the sine squared plus the cosine squared equals one is the Pythagorean identity. And it is so named because it comes from right triangle, not right triangle trigonometry. It just comes from the Pythagorean identity um, theorem. So here's a unit circle. A unit circle has a radius of one, that there is a radius of the unit circle, so that there is one. And now we've got a right triangle, and the Pythagorean identity says that this side squared plus this side squared equals this side squared. The cosine squared plus the sine squared equals one squared. Well, one squared is one, so there's the Pythagorean identity. All right, so first week, I mean, maybe, you probably have classes Friday, but for us, it's the end of the first week. So congratulations. Um, I'm looking forward to a great semester with you and I will see you Monday. Um, as a reminder, I'm doing, we call it the correction roster, but it's the our student submitting homework roster um, and you are required to submit homework for financial aid. The fact that I'm seeing you sitting here in this class you might think would be enough but welcome to State College bureaucracy. Um, so please make sure you do the homework that's due Sunday. It will cause potentially issues if you don't. And with that, I will see you next week.